Welcome into another episode of the Ots and Audibles podcast. Eric Scopel, Jared Mack here today. Day one of fall camp. We talked about, I'm trying to think what the natural uh, metaphor for this is, because if media day was the first day of class, I don't know what this is. I guess this is like the first um, day of class after the orientation day, maybe. Maybe maybe I misspoke. Wednesday was like freshman orientation day. Now I'm really just butchering this metaphor. Um, sure. I and guess today is more of a first day of class than yeah, media day. People were doing stuff. They had a full, they had a practice this afternoon. Sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Oregon was out in the practice terms. We'll get to a bunch of stuff in terms of what we saw, but I, I thought we'd start with just kind of Dan's opening statement, what Dan had to say after practice. As you'd expect, day one of fall camp wasn't perfect. I know apparently in Los Angeles, you've had perfect practices early on in spring camp. The best to, ever run. Yeah. Colin, yeah, Colin Coward, Lincoln Riley, miles ahead of Dan Landing's practices, apparently. Because Dan came out with like a lot of optimism for the direction, but also admitted like they're a ways away from playing games. They need to work on a lot of things. If this was if they were to play soon, it wouldn't be pretty. But that's the kind of thing you want to hear, I think, honestly, from your head coach. I think it would be weird, honestly, if he came out and was like, We killed it. This, this was great. This was yeah. so good. We're uh, taking I, the rest of August off. Yeah. We, we actually decided we're not practicing again. We're, we did, did yeah. so well. Like, we don't even need to do more. Um, and we have to also acknowledge that um, they weren't in they, – they can't be in pads until early next week. They were basically in shorts and jerseys and helmets and, and trainers, not even cleats. So they're not out there doing full contact stuff. And I'm sure the drills that – and we didn't get to watch a ton. We'll get into some of what we saw later. But um, it's not like I'm sure – they were in a ton of game-like situations anyway to even simulate what a game would be like. But what they were in was a situation where clearly Dan came away thinking execution wasn't perfect. He mentioned some of the conditioning wasn't perfect. He talked about how the speed of the team looks great, but by the time they got to drill period eight, it wasn't quite as impressive because guys were a little gassed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and then just overall toughness. You know, it, one thing I wasn't even sure we talked about, but I will because I've got it written down in my notebook here is they did put up four new keywords inside the practice fields. No, because it, it's going to connect. And the words all right, all right. the words are connection, toughness, growth, and sacrifice. And Dan did bring up the fact that toughness was something that was lacking today from the players in terms of how they were practicing. And that if they want to get to the growth part, they need to work on the toughness part. And I'm sure if you were to continue the, the narrative, you could get them to say, they need to show more of word four, sacrifice, to get to more of the growth part. And they need more of word one to get to the growth part, too, because like they all kind of work together that way. Um, but I think notably, day one of camp, you kind of expect some ups and downs, and that's what it sounded like happened. Yeah, this is exactly what I would expect Dan Lanning's first press conference to be after the first practice of the first fall camp of his first year at Oregon. Um, just a lot of firsts there in a sentence by me, a lot of firsts going on going in Eugene for Dan. Um, it's just going to be a lot of ups and downs. He, he, he was, you know, very obviously, I think he started with good first day, but they're nowhere near ready to play in a game. And that's, you know, that's what you'd expect. There's a lot of newcomers still. We'll get to that in a bit too. There's a lot of guys returning. There's a lot of new, um, you know, installs on offense and defense. And again, they're just in shorts and, Based in just their jerseys and some helmets. They're not in anything crazy. There's no hitting. Um, this seemed like a cardio day for a lot of guys. Um, I'm sure yeah. that's just basically what it was like. Maybe there was some one on ones or you know, kind of like a seven on seven component of, of practice, but it wasn't going to be anything crazy. It just is the, it, you know, it signifies the beginning of fall camp. It signifies the beginning of the college football season. Um, and for what we were able to watch, um, that's basically what it looked like. It wasn't, we, I don't think any of us expected there to be some competition period or for it to be really high, highly intense in terms of physicality. But, you know, it was clear that uh, the strength, the strength cat strength staff, excuse me, who led the opening warmups, obviously Wilson Love is very into it. Um, Lanning, you could be heard echoing through, I'm sure that entire area. So if you live near Otson, I'm sure you heard Lanning today at one point. Um, so there, obviously it's intense in that sense that the practices aren't lackadaisical or anything like that, but it's the first day of, it's the first day of school. You know, nobody goes too hard on the first day of school unless it's some AP physics course that you did all the summer work for, which certainly, you know, that's, 
it's uh, something different, but today was Jared, just. I'm, I'm like really excited to keep this. Uh, I'm Jared. I'm really excited to keep this uh, school narrative and like. Metaphor. Should we do it the entire season? Yeah, the entire year. Uh, it's week uh, eight midterms. Midterms. Here oh, <laughs> final Here comes. Games. Here we go. All right, I like it. All right, so UCLA uh, will be yeah. Yeah. yeah, UCLA is midterms, I guess, and and the bowl and the Pac-12 championship or bowl game is final exams, I guess. Georgia's um, like the worst pop quiz you've ever had in your life. Yeah, Georgia's a terrible pop quiz that you had no preparation for, which is obviously not accurate because they're going to be preparing like <laughs> crazy the next month to get ready for it. Um, I don't think they'll be unprepared. I think they'll be matching. They'll be facing a syllabus that's just very challenging. Put it that way. Um, there you go. Uh, let's. I, I think there was a couple of. Uh, individuals that dan brought up i did i did want to before we get into that just bring up i think perfect participation from a scholarship perspective as far as i could tell um i did get there early i do have on my notebooks all the players that were there i think it's perfect attendance from a scholarship perspective as far as i could tell james crepe did the same exercise we we compared notes and we think everyone was there two players i, uh, I sadly missed out on that opportunity to join you um yep. Had some, S, had some SD card trouble today, just couldn't find it. Ended up getting there uh, punctual early, frankly, but not early enough. So tomorrow, tomorrow we will be able to compare notes and, and really figure out who was there and who wasn't you weren't, there. You weren't 50 minutes early like I was. Uh, humble brag. But, uh, no, and two players not fully taking part. Offensive lineman TJ Bass was watching the offensive line, was doing some agility drills while they were doing, um, again, it's not full contact, but some sort of technique drills, of kind of uh, engagement with the other offensive linemen, working on technique and all that. He was doing some agility stuff. I don't look, it didn't look serious. Dan Landing was actually asked afterwards. And I know I already said, Dan's not going to talk injuries. He didn't really talk injuries. J James Crepia no. asked, was it serious? He says, no. And then the other player, Justice Lowe, was the lone – I guess he forms a one-man rehab group because he was um, pulling a sled up a hill, which which sounds weird. It sounds it reminds me of, like, what I would have been doing in, like, December of 2001 when I was, like, 12 years old with my little sled going down the, the snow. But, like, a weight sled. They're working on some – like, getting some strength back in his legs. He's also doing a stationary bike um, when we left. Dan also asked about justice. Didn't seem to indicate there was anything serious there. Both, I think, were just one-word answers of no. Jared will have the full so. transcript up later on on Duck Territory. I'm sure it's going to be fun doing that one. What was going on with this guy? Nothing. What was with this guy? Nothing. Um, Quick and easy. Great news because the guys that were not taking part in the in the spring, I should say, Justin, Justin Flo, Brandon Doralis, Popo Amavai, I can go through Keon Moore Hudson. There's a lot more names that were in and out. Everybody else was taking part. In fact, like it was not only full participation, but like, or a full uh, attendance is perfect almost, but basically full participation with the exception of two guys who it doesn't sound like are serious. So that's great on the injury front to start fall camp. And then I did want to just because we're talking kind of uh, sticking with the Dan part of this, thought it was notable. You know, he hasn't been someone really to single out individuals. I don't know if you really singled him out because I think he was asked about him first. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But Caleb Chapman, yeah. transfer receiver out of Texas A&M. Dan was like pretty excited about what Caleb kind of showed day one and, and the kind of prospects of what he can be at Oregon. And it's notable because this is the guy we haven't talked a lot about. Um, I wonder if he would have been here in spring, if we'd be having similar, if we'd have, you know, a Caleb Chapman, Chase Coda, we'd be talking about them kind of similarly in terms of both being senior wide receiver transfers, both the same initials, by the way, CC, um, both guys that have dealt with kind of a little bit of ups and downs in their career. Caleb's had a lot of injuries. Chase just kind of had up and down usage, I guess, and offenses. But I think people feel pretty confident about them both. But I thought Dan seemed pretty excited about Caleb's first day, and I thought that was notable. Yeah, he was originally asked about Jordan James, who – Dan said has performed well and, and had a nice long run today. So that's a good sign as well. Um, but then he brought up, because I think he was, he was originally asked by Jordan about Jordan James and the freshman newcomers, but he brought up Chapman as a newcomer who's not a freshman, which Chapman is not. I think he's in his final year of eligibility, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm not a hundred percent sure, Eric, can you look that up? Um, yeah, he's a senior. Yeah. But Chapman is a, a six foot five wide receiver who was, Pretty good at Texas A&M, but like Eric said, really limited by injuries. He had two season-ending injuries in 2019 and 2020. Uh, 2020 was his best season, or at least was looking like it's going to be his best season. Um, 
He had seven catches for 150 yards and two touchdowns against the number four, number five ranked Florida team uh, during the 2020 pandemic shortened season. 2021, he missed the season. And this this past year, uh, you know, he transfers to Oregon. Um, this could be, I, I think, you know, we've talked about this before, probably on this podcast, but I know Eric and I have talked about this before in general. Um, a very low risk, high reward guy. Um, obviously, this is a, we think it's a very deep and a talented wide receiver room. On paper, it looks like that. Um, during the games, we'll have to see, but it, there was a lot of shining moments, especially in the Alamo Bowl and the spring game, that, that leads you to believe that this could be a good wide receiver room. Um, and Chapman could be somebody who is just a completely different body type. He's like a mature version of Dante Thornton because they're both six foot five. Thornton's still on the skinny side, although I don't think they're going by the skinnies anymore. I think they're going by the hot boys, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Which so, is – is that better? I don't know, man. Is that better? I guess it is. I don't know. I think I don't want to go by anything like where I'm the skinnies in a sport that is really where you don't want to be overly skinny. Yeah. I also don't know if I'm self-proclaiming myself one of the hot boys. I don't know if that's something you'll ever get, get me to do. Yeah, but you, you know, you know, we're not Dante Thornton. So. <laughs> we're not Dante. Well, I'm, I'm not going to question the guy, but <laughs> Chapman, I, th- I think, is a very low risk, a high reward guy. He's, yeah, he's kind of like a one year deal in the NBA or professional sports, where it's like, well, if he if he takes off, that's great. You got him for one year. Um, but if he doesn't, then he's he's here for one year and could provide depth. But I'm excited to watch him play. I'm excited to see where he slots in the depth chart. Um, I'm kind of just excited to see where he plays in the field because I feel like he has you know, he could he's probably going to be on the outside because he is a six foot five target. Um, but you know, down in the goal line, it could I could see him doing something on the inside too and just taking up space and taking away defenders from other people or just posting up somebody using it as like almost an end zone fade, not a goal line fade. But I, I think it's really interesting that Dan brought him up because like you said, Eric, he does, does not really bring up people just because um, you either have to directly ask him who it is, or he has to be just like the second coming of somebody and to, for him to talk about them. I'm going to pose the question that Jared Denny of on three posed to us afterwards, or maybe he just made a proclamation, which was he doesn't think Chapman can be one of Oregon's five best receivers. And I think he's probably right. And the five best being Thornton, Franklin, Coda, McGee, and Hudson. Probably right. But I'm not totally off. I'm like totally not discounting the fact that he ends up being one of those guys. As we talked about, like really unique athletically, big experienced like i think he could contribute i think he could push his way into that discussion but i do think i agree ultimately with what other jared uh denny of of, of again rival website who we happen to be friends with so we're outing our friendship here our, with with, with <laughs> one of the competitors everybody but, knows what's that everybody, everybody knows. knows now oh no but uh i think we kind of all i, I kind of agree with his sense of like that there's a a, a quintet a group of five that everybody feels pretty good about being kind of the group. But I think if there's a guy on the roster who could force their way into that, it's probably him. It's probably him. I don't, I know. I, I think, yeah, I think he's the obvious pick. I mean, Isaiah Bravard, I think has all the physical gifts and the talent to do something. It's just, we, we haven't seen him do it. And at least Caleb has actually like gone through college season has actually produced at a high level, although albeit for a short time, um, I'm just looking through the roster right now. Um, you know, Coda's Casper. already there. Tyler Casper, Tyler Casper who Lanning mentioned again today, um, who said he who made a nice catch. He didn't elaborate it. He just – Kyler made a nice catch. So that's good, I, I'm sure. Um, Justice Lowe is another guy who's out there. But Isaiah Crocker, too. He's been around Josh the program. Delgado. Josh Delgado. Yeah. There are, I mean, there are options, but I think the size and the speed – that Caleb Chapman possesses and the physical maturity and the maturity of playing multiple football seasons, I think probably puts him at a higher level than everybody else. Um, I would probably say Crocker and Delgado are the two that could probably be in that group. But again, I think the size and the speed and the length that Chapman has puts him ahead. Not to extend this conversation too much further because we didn't outline seven minutes of wide receiver talk, but there was not a whole lot in the back end in terms of what we saw at practice. So we'll no. just use it here. Yeah, yeah. Um, Delgado is one that's interesting. Cause I do think he gets kind of forgotten a little bit. And I, I did think it was notable. And I know he's probably good friends, I think, but Sean dollars, when we did our 
breakout players of the year predictions we asked. Go check this out up on the side. I think it's a pretty good content piece. But we asked, I think it ended up being 19 answers we got up of uh, who on the team, you know, had a good offseason and could have a quote-unquote breakout season. And dollars pointed to, to Josh Delgado. I think, again, they grew up in the same part of Southern California. I think they've known each other for a while. I think part of the same recruiting class, I'm pretty sure. Um, you're, you're after for dollars, I think. Is it a year after? You're probably right. Yeah, they're close regardless. They, they, they've been around the program a long time. I think pretty good friends. I just thought that was kind of notable. Delgado is a guy who I know for me, I just kind of forget about. And I don't know if that's totally fair because I think injuries hurt him, you know, one of the years recently and last year. Um, but you think back to his first season, I think in that was at 19. Yeah. Sort of like had some decent moments. was like, come, come up productive. Might have started a couple games. Like, I, I just think he might be. Start, a, yeah. He started a bunch of games. Might like be he was the point. starter against Auburn. Uh, if I, but I got a lot of injuries on that team too. Yeah, I think that's an interesting name. Um, he's just I, – I think the problem is like Chapman is like there's a lot of guys in front of him who play the same kind of spot because Delgado is a slot guy and just because of his body type and his play style. But you have Hudson in front of him, McGee, and even Coda could probably play the slot too if he's not a possession guy out wide. So, again – um, not a wide receiver talk for <laughs> for a practice where we didn't see a single football thrown to anybody but either an assistant or an offensive lineman. Yeah, uh, three <laughs> starts in 2019 just to finish. Let's just put – like let's tie a bow on that segment. Um, nice, nice. Really, there isn't much more. We talked about doing 20 minutes. We'll probably do just over that. Um, I think – talk I got about some specialist stuff. You want me to get yeah, into I, that? I wanted to get into that. I wanted to yeah. – but first I wanted to talk quarterback centers and who's snapping to who because – it sounds ridiculous. We didn't get a watch a ton, and that's that's fine. I understand it. It's early on in camp. Frankly, it would probably not be to anyone's benefit for us to watch them maybe just like in shorts and jerseys kind of struggle to throw the ball around and, and all that. So I'm totally understanding of that. Um, but, like, I think there's two things we saw that are kind of notable from a uh, depth chart, playing time, position battle perspective. And the first one I want to talk about is centers to quarterback snapping, which again sounds absurd that we're making anything out of this. But I think it's probably somewhat notable that Alex Forsyth snapped to Bo Nix. Ryan Walk snapped to Ty Thompson. Cannon Rossi, a walk-on, snapped to Ty Tom- or sorry, sorry, Jay Butterfield. Cannon, by the way, he's a walk-on, but he was like second string center most of spring. And I think he's a guy that they look at as, I don't know, I'm not going to say he's ever going to have a Ryan Walk career where he'll get a scholarship. But he's kind of in that mold where he's a pretty respected walk-on guy. Like he, he he's yeah. not he's not a and I, again this sounds derogatory to walk-ons in general. So I should probably stop talking. But like he's a guy. Like he he's he's he could have a role on this team in future years, possibly this year if injuries go crazy. Like I think that the staff probably trusts him more than other walk-ons. So maybe a fair way of saying it. Um, and then hold uh, Holden Whipple, new walk-on, uh, was snapping to Jake Van Dyne. Um, uh, who's a walk-on transfer from Missouri State. Uh, and then Jackson Powers Johnson was the fifth guy snapping, and he was snapping to uh, Marcus Sanders, who's a, a, a true freshman quarterback walk-on. The last two names I brought up there probably don't mean much because I don't think any of us expect Van Dyne or Sanders to play. And if they do, boy, the season's probably in a really crappy spot. Not to be mean, but those are walk-on guys that you bring here not thinking they're going to probably play much at all, if ever. Um, but I did think sort of notable foresight yeah. to Knicks. That kind of indicates what we expected coming in is probably somewhat true, which is that Knicks is, is opening camp as, and again, maybe we're reading too much into it, but I don't think it's by accident that they have it that way. I think there has to be some hierarchy. And Forsyth was snapping to Knicks. That feels notable. Thompson being, quote, unquote, ahead of Butterfield feels somewhat notable. Um, again, the rest of probably doesn't matter much, but Stuff we're passing along that kind of means something. And unless you have anything else on that and kind of any takeaways there, because I don't know if there's too much, Jared. I'll throw it to you just for special teams. Yeah, I think my one takeaway is is Jackson Powers Johnson being, like, I guess the fourth or the fifth center. I think that's that kind of shows that this staff looks like they prefer him as a guard more than a center. So Mm -hmm. I think that's something I don't – Again, Powers Johnson, when he played last season, I think he primarily played guard. I don't really think he played center because I think Walk moved to center when Forsyth was hurt. You're right. You're so, exactly. Yeah. Um, Powers Johnson was also hurt for a majority of the season as well. But I, I don't really 
I don't mind him. I like him at a guard. I like him at a center. I like him playing. Let's just be as simple as that. All right, special teams are everybody's favorites. Um, I'll start with the kick returners first. Uh, in order, kick returners on kick kickoffs, not not punt returns. Uh, Christian Gonzalez, uh, Marquise Irving, who's donning number zero this season. Byron Cardwell, Sean Dollars, Noah Whittington, and Dar- Darren Barkins were in order of how they received from the kick machine, which is not a punt machine. It is a kickoff machine. Thank you, James Crepia of the Oregonian. Punt returns. We have Chris Hudson, Seven McGee, Chase Coda, um, Jordan James, number 20. Sorry, I can't remember his, his number. And then Josh Delgado. That was it for punt returners. Um as far as punters go, I think can that we, this is the most – Yeah, we hold the thought because I just wanted to reflect on the return stuff before I move to the punter stuff? And now we're kind of teasing something interesting because the punting is actually a good question. I can tell you're excited to talk about it. Okay, for the, for the, for the listener slash viewer, were punt and kick returns happening simultaneously? Yes. Okay. And I ask that because I think most listening would expect to hear Chris Hudson and Seven McGee's name very prominently as kick returners as well. And there were punt returners because those guys handled the duties last year. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I think we'll just, we'll have to see what, what Dan figures out because maybe he likes the combination of, of Christian Gonzalez and Marquise Irving back there as kick returners and not, not seven McGee as a punt returner. It very well could be. I don't know. I'm just trying to make the distinction for the listener of like, we heard yeah, those names separated. I think it's very possible because they were going on simultaneously that the punt returners also factor into the kick returners. One other note before we go to punter, I'm calling Marquis Irving Bucky. I just exclu- he, I asked him what he wanted to go by and he said Bucky. So Bucky, I'm Irv- Bucky Irving, you can do whatever you want, but I'm he's a, he's Bucky to me. That's fair. I do like Marquis as a name. I think it's pretty darn cool. So another quick thing though, in spring camp, the same style of practice. These are the same names, albeit without Jordan James and Bucky Irving. These are the same names that were receiving kickoffs and receiving punts. So good point. Like the the combination of Chris Seven Chase Delgado in some order were always the dudes fielding punts. The combination of Gonzalez, Cardwell, Dollars, Whittington, Barkins always fielding kickoff. So I don't know if they have this preference over one or the other and who does what. I don't know. We'll find out. Moving on to punters. Now, a reminder that Oregon brought in four transfer kickers this past offseason. And joining Camden Lewis, they brought on Andrew Boyle, a transfer from Washington State, Adam Barry, a transfer from Tempe, or Temple, excuse me, Ross James, a junior college transfer from East Central Community College. In Alex Bales, Brandon, Brandon, Missouri, and then Alex Bales, who was a transfer from Cincinnati as a kicker. Um, the punters in order of punting were Boyle, Adam Barry, Ross James, and then for kicking, where they did little like squib kicks to offensive and defensive linemen to help them train in that in that special teams area. Um, the kickers in order were Camden Lewis and then Alex Bales. Um, I don't think there was a lot to take away. I thought that there were a lot of, frankly, I thought that there were a lot of poor punts today at practice. I was watching the actual punts themselves. A lot of them careened into uh, outside the boundaries. But then again, it was a really small area that they were going into. There was only one real misfire. I don't remember who it was from. Um, Eric, I know you'll, you'll think this is interesting, but it was uh, Carson Battles and then uh, Luke Basso. It were better the snappers. be. It better yeah, be Luke so. Basso. He's the future yeah. of the snapping game, boys. Everybody needs to he know is, that. He is the future. Uh, everybody needs to know Holden Whipple as well. I think that will not be the last time we reference him on this podcast. Um, yeah, just real quick, that was about it from practice today. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, nothing. I Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, and I'm sorry, I don't need to cut you off there because it sounded like you were wrapping up and I just had a couple thoughts on special teams. Punchers are concerned. Punters are yeah, yeah, big time. Big Tom, time. Snee, Tom Snee was really good the last couple of years. He averaged like 43 yards a punt for two consecutive seasons. Like, I think his predecessor, Blake Mayamone and Josh Bidwell are like the, and I may be forgetting one other. I just did a special teams all time list. I think those are the only guys to do over 42 yards in two consecutive seasons in school history. 
I think it's overlooked a little bit. I know one year is a COVID shortened season, but Tom Snee is probably on your Mount Rushmore of Oregon punters. Which oh, are we doing a Mount Rushmore? I don't think Oregon anybody's punter. ever done the exercise. But if you look at the numbers, I think he's he's there or he's definitely on the cusp. So this is a pretty special punter, and I don't I'm a, I'm concerned. You know, Andrew Boyle comes from Washington State. He was a kickoff specialist. He was also listed as a punter. But based upon the stats I'm seeing here, he had two punts for two punts, right? 89 yards in 21, which is not terrible, right? That's 44 yards per punt. But that's that's a pretty very, good. Very small. Very small. Um, you know, I don't have Adam Barry's. Actually, pull that up for me if you can. Give me Adam Barry's career stats from Temple because I, I would like to see what that looks like. But I, I'm there's an article here. about him. I don't remember it off the top of my head, though, surprisingly. Okay. It's disappointing. But I know. <laughs> I'm so, so sorry. I, I bring this all up to say, like, I. I think this is this is one of the positions that is a little concerning. I'm I'm, I'm confident in Joe Lorg and they'll get it figured out. But you look at the rest of the special team stuff. I you know we ran through the punters and kickoff return guys, like or the punt return and kickoff return guys. I I like a lot of those names. All those guys have already shown at Oregon that they can return. A lot of those guys were really high end players at other schools returning punts or kicks. So like I have no con- I don't have many concerns at all about who's returning punts and kicks. I think they'll have quality players out there. I think Camden Lewis is – I probably still have a little PTSD from 2019 and 20 when he was really not doing very well. But 2021, he was – again, if you want to do a Mount Rushmore of single season kicking, mm-hmm. like be surprised to find that Camden's is probably like a top six to eight individual kicking season in school history, and he was second team all conference. Like he's – I think I, I'm pretty – I'm comfortable with Camden Lewis being your place kicker. I don't know what to think about punter. Um, I, I, I got some Adam Barry stats if you want them. Hit me with it. What do you got? All right. So Adam Barry last season at Temple punted 63 times, which is a lot. A lot. <laughs> That's a lot of times. Five per um, game. <laughs> 63 times for 2,643 yards. That comes out to an average just shy of 42. Um, he bad. at When they played Cincinnati, he punted seven times for 300 yards, about 43 yards per punt. Um, his long on the season is 58. Um, he only had three games all season where he did not have a punt that went over 50 yards. So I think he's got a boot on him. Okay. Um, he has, yeah, he had 13 punts of the 63 last season that went over 50 yards. So I think that's pretty good. Um, only 13 that went inside the inside the 20. But then again, that's all about like, Place well, was he punting from position. his own 10, blah, blah, blah. So I think he he is certainly a contender. Um, I could bring up, I could look up Ross James's stats too, if you'd like me to do that. And I, I made, right. and I'll just can say, you, can you filibuster for? A oh, I bit? can absolutely filibuster. How much do you need? Two minutes, minute, minute and a half. I, I uh, think, let's see. I think um, I you know those numbers are really encouraging. By the way, um, from from Barry, I. I admittedly hadn't looked which is disappointing because i am the special teams guy Eric, he also, oh this this person this the eastern eastern central community college their entire website already has it figured out i don't have to do any math temple what are we doing guys come on we'll, we'll, we'll hit, hit, we'll hit me with ross james and then we can do kind of the last thoughts on puncher and we'll, we'll sign off sure thing so ross james uh last season as a true freshman had 62 punts <laughs> good lord active for 20, <laughs> 2,514 yards, averaging just a shade over 40, uh, 40 and a half to be exact. His long of the season was 63 yards, 21 plates inside the 20, um, two touchbacks all season. Okay. So, so what, what, what I think I'm, those are, I think those are options. Yeah. I was gonna say what I'm learning here is, is maybe this is a little bit further along than I think, or I thought, um, you know, Boyle, Boyle clearly being the number one, so to speak, on day one is interesting. It maybe speaks to the confidence there. And maybe maybe I'm unnecessarily bedwetting, so to speak, in terms of just like I'm over here being a little too nervous. I haven't been <laughs> – I'll stop that thought. I, <laughs> but, I, but I guess it's a, it's, it's a term I've heard used. But, no, I, I guess maybe I'm too concerned here and I shouldn't be because maybe these guys have a little better career resumes. Their CVs are a little better than, than I thought. But – I, I do think that's a position to, to be kind of tracking for sure. And, and of the special so, positions, that's the one I know the least about or have the least confidence. What's up? 
I got a question to turn this into a 30 minute long podcast. We're already at 30 right now. Right. Do you, is there a world where Camden Lewis loses the kicking job to Alex Bales? Sure. It's probably a world. I'm just, I'm, I'm just kind of going through the numbers right now. And here I am going down this rabbit hole. So our good friend Alex had 85 kickoffs. He was the kickoff specialist for Cincinnati who went to, you know, the, the college football playoffs. By the way, season. before you even finish that thought, Jared, I would 100% concede Camden Lewis probably won't be the kickoff specialist. Okay. And, and I would say it sounds like I'm giving your guy, the Cincinnati dude, Bales, a pretty good shot at it. If you, that's his responsibility. Because Camden would even tell you in the spring, he was – that's that's a thing he needed to work on. Yeah, and, and our good friend Bales, he has 84 kickoff attempts and 45 of them were touchbacks. It's good. It's pretty so, good. It's, hey, that's a lot of kickoff attempts. That's a, it's a good amount. Um, 45 is good, only three out of bounds. I think Lewis had – like two in a game at one point during his career. Uh, the other thing about Bales, he's 12 of 13 on point after attempts, but only two of five on field goals. So yeah. it was, this that could be how Oregon operates this season. You know, Dan does. Dan has said in the past about specifically young players, like figuring out what they're really good at, making them do that, and not making them do something that they're not good at, which on paper, very good idea. That's how you should live life. But we'll see if, they, if he applies that terminology and that kind of, of coaching style to honestly to kicking because I think that might might behoove them to do so and have Camden as your kickoff kicking guy your field goal kicker and Bales as your touch or kickoff guy your touchback specialist touch up I, I kind of anticipate that'll be what happens again day one of fall camp a lot of time to go uh this fall a lot of time to get into the season as you said Camden was the first one quote unquote operating as kickoff specialist still um, we didn't see any place kicking, so we really don't have anything to draw from. I, I think Camden, at least a year ago, maybe has a terrible fall camp and they, they take away the responsibility. Um, I think Camden has enough goodwill coming off of 21 to open the season, at least as a kicker. And then if it doesn't go well, it sounds like you at least have a guy behind him who can fill in. And, and the one thing I will also say, and I asked the question to Dan on Wednesday and he didn't answer. And we're extending this podcast in part because now I'm thinking about it. We were going to do a, a special teams preview for fall. And we, talked, so we didn't have enough information. We've kind of got some information now, so I think it's okay to extend this a little bit. Um, we don't have to go too much longer. Jared's looking at his watch. He's like, I got dinner in 10. Um, no, I, uh, Tyrone Taylor hit a home run off Robert Duggar at 102 miles an hour off the bat. So. Sick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, so uh, the, the point I was, was, was making was I kind of lost my train of thought there, I think, a little bit. We're talking about punting. What was it talking about? I don't even know. Kicking, punting, Camden Lewis. Oh, kicking plenty in Camden Lewis, all the topics that I enjoy so much. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I guess the point I was, was going to make was that we, we didn't talk much about it earlier this week. We wanted to get some information. You kind of go through it. It seems like they've got probably more options in terms of punters than I had given him credit without having Tom here. I know where I was going now. This is what I was I had asked Dan about, but he didn't uh, give us any information on, is holding – and now this is getting super by right. Details, but right. Usually it's been the punter that holds. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that is something they continue to do. I even asked that straight up. Like, does is the, is the plan for whoever wins the punting job to be the, the holder on field goals and extra points? And, and he didn't. He kind of talked his way around that one. Tom Snee was the, the holder the last two years when Camden Lewis really started to put it together, especially last year. I, I do wonder about – losing some of that continuity. I know Camden talked in the spring about the value of, of having the same snapper, having the same holder, having the same place kicker, and that kind of order of operations of the ball is going to get to this guy at this point of time. He knows how to put it down the way I like it, and I can kick it, and it's kind of it becomes kind of second nature. I do wonder uh, if interrupting, you know, removing one of those parts and putting somebody else in, if that could potentially – negatively impact Camden a little bit, but just, just thinking through the process here. So um, I don't know. Is there more on special teams you have Jared? Cause I think we've kind of run through all I was kind of thinking through. No, I don't have anything more. Um, I was just going to say, yeah, there's a chance that I could do something with Camden. Um, but I don't, 
I don't know. I don't. I, I thought it was strange in general to just to begin with that Dan wouldn't really answer that question. Um, I wonder why. What does that mean? It probably all means absolutely nothing. But it's that you know, it just seems like a simple question to answer. I don't know if he's giving too much away by saying, "Oh, yeah, we have uh, Alex Bales. He's our backup kicker and our holder." He it probably means my question had too many questions in it, and he chose to not answer that part of it, which. I'm noticing if you ask him three questions, he's probably going to pick the ones, the, the, the one question you care least about. And I think I, that was a multi question <laughs> I asked. So I'm learning, trying to figure out the best way to approach it. Um, Oregon will be back on Saturday to uh, for its second day of fall camp. We'll have full coverage. We'll have practice reports. We'll give kind of the no. There was a player. I'm not even going to mention the name, but we'll see tomorrow. And I'll, if, if the player's healthy, I'll mention it. If he's not healthy, I'll mention it. There was a player we saw leading practice, not a prominent player, but we did see someone leading practice. I don't want to – we were told not to bring the players by name up, so I'm not going to. But we did see a guy leaving practice. Don't know about the severity of an injury, but that for the trainer. So that did happen. Um, didn't seem, again, super serious or anything. But wanted to throw that out there. We'll have a, we'll follow up on that tomorrow on our show because we'll have a practice report. We'll have interviews with Kenny Dillingham, the offensive coordinator, Tosh Lupoy, the defensive coordinator. Um, transcripts from both, well, videos from both. We'll have the whole shebang. So uh, stick with us tomorrow. Sunday's an off day. They'll be back on Monday, though, and we'll have more coverage. So um, for Eric Scopel and Jared Mack, you've been listening to the Odds and Audibles podcast. Talk to you later, folks. Peace. <laughs>